60 Minutes on Sunday Night featured one of the new stars of this field and lamented the fact that big tech companies sometimes heed their warnings and obey their decrees, but not always. And it's really fascinating that, as I've said many times, it is now journalists, media outlets, employees of media outlets who have the HR title journalist who are now taking the lead in demanding that our political discourse be more censored. And here is a profile of this person from 60 Minutes and gives you a really good insight into how our corporate media now thinks about the dangers of what they call unfettered political speech online. As in this case, a tweet in 2022 from Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene falsely claiming that there were extremely high amounts of COVID vaccine deaths. I have not misled anyone. I've not put out misinformation. Twitter eventually banned Green's personal account for multiple violations of its COVID policy. Facebook and YouTube also removed or labeled posts they deemed misinformation. Big tech's out to get conservatives. That's not a suspicion. That's not a hunch. That's a fact. Confronted with criticisms from conservatives like Congressman Jim Jordan that the social media companies were censoring their views and because of cost cutting, platforms began downsizing their fact checking teams. So today, social media is teeming with misinformation. Now, first of all, if you notice there, they frame this as a conservative versus a liberal debate. Only conservatives, say 60 Minutes, are concerned about the fact that a consortium of state agencies and the government and very well-funded, newly materialized organizations that purport to identify disinformation are now working with big tech companies to impose limits, not just even on ordinary citizens, but even on elected officials. And every time they cite an example of disinformation, as they just did. It is always somebody, not even who's just a Republican, but somebody who is an anti-establishment conservative, somebody outside of the boundaries of establishment thought, because that is really what this is aimed at doing, is to enforce the prerogatives of establishment authority, institutions of authority, to do what they've always done, which is to centralize information. The internet has taken that away from them, and the only way they can get it back is if they can regain control over the flow of information. As we well know, and you can believe it was well-intentioned or not, there were all sorts of claims made just as part of the COVID pandemic that ended up being false. That came not from people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and, Green and other people who were censored online, but that came from Dr. Fauci and from the leading experts who we were told to believe, and anybody who disagreed with their pronouncements, even though they turned out to be false in many cases, even though they contradicted themselves many times. At the beginning of the pandemic, Dr. Fauci told everybody not to wear masks, that wearing masks as a means to protect yourself against COVID was unscientific and counterproductive. Then a month later, he said, Anybody who doesn't wear a mask is acting irresponsibly. They contradicted themselves. They issued all sorts of statements that proved to be untrue. And it wasn't just people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who, by the way, is an elected member of Congress, who was censored online, but also people with the highest amounts of scientific credentials, including people like Jay Bhattacharya, who is an epidemiologist and a uh, professor of medicine at Stanford and is one of the plaintiffs in that lawsuit I just referenced, who's Political expression was limited and censored online during the pandemic because it deviated from the scientific establishment. This is censorship as grave as it gets. And it, in some way, unfortunately, is true that only conservatives have objected. And we just looked at the data showing that Democrats overwhelmingly, in fact, three out of four, believe in this framework of censorship in the name of disinformation. Here's 60 Minutes going on with their view of what this system not only is, but what it should be. Like these posts suggesting tanks are moving across the Texas-Mexico border, but it's actually footage from Chile. These are AI-generated images of, well, see for yourself. 
With social media moderation teams shrinking, a new target is misinformation academic researchers. All right, now let me just go back here. This was an example of completely random people online who posted a video of tanks rolling across the southern border and when in fact, as she said, it wasn't really that. These are And then AI here was a image, an obviously false image of Joe Biden and Donald Trump standing next together, next to one another. And again, it was a completely false image. And if you look down at the bottom, you see that it was liked by a grand total of two people. So they're kicking out these extremely inconsequential instances of disinformation to try and claim that the culprits are American citizens. These are the same media outlets that lied the country into a major war, the invasion of Iraq, by spreading disinformation far more damaging and egregious than anything they're showing on the screen. That the government of Iraq possessed, secretly possessed nuclear weapons, and was in an alliance with Al-Qaeda. They misled people into believing that Saddam Hussein had participated in the 9-11 attack, something they knew they needed to do to convince Americans to invade Iraq as a response to 9-11. They're the people who lied to the American public in 2016 that Donald Trump had colluded with and worked with the Russians to hack into the DNC emails in 2020. Again and again and again, these are the people from whom the far more consequential uh, disinformation is emanating. And what they do constantly to shield themselves and to distract you from that is they want you to look at your fellow citizens and think, oh, it's your fellow citizens, the people with no platforms, who are spreading fake pictures that are being liked by two people. This is the reason we need censorship. This is the reason we're being misled, not by them, but by your fellow citizens. ...images of, well, see for yourself. With social media moderation teams shrinking, a new target is misinformation academic researchers who began working closely with the platforms after evidence of Russian interference online in the 2016 election. Are researchers being chilled? Absolutely. Kate Starbird is a professor at the University of Washington, a former professional basketball player, and a leader of a misinformation research group created ahead of the 2020 election. All right, so let's review that. She is an academic. She's at Stanford University. She's part of a consortium of people who are calling themselves misinformation researchers or disinformation experts. She's being featured on 60 Minutes as some kind of a heroic battler and crusader against disinformation. And yet you're about to hear how she's being victimized, how she's being unfairly targeted, how people are criticizing her. And for some reason, this is some sort of terrible event that we all need to lament. She's trying to protect us from hearing false claims. And instead of everybody applauding her and thanking her for it, people instead are questioning whether or not this is a function that Kate Starbird has the right to perform in 60 Minutes regards this criticism of her, someone so noble and benevolent and wise, as some kind of a national emergency. These people shouldn't be criticized or questioned. They should be applauded and heralded. We were very specifically looking at misinformation about election processes, procedures, and election results. And if we saw something about that, we would pass it along to the platforms if we thought it violated their, one of their policies. Here's an example, a November 2020 tweet saying that election software in Michigan switched 6,000 votes from Trump to Biden. The researchers alerted Twitter that then decided to label it with a warning. I understand that some of the researchers, including you, have uh, had some threats against them, death threats. I have received one. Sometimes they're threats with something behind them, and sometimes they're just there to make you nervous. She received a grand total of one death threat, she says. And you know, I'd like to see that death threat. A lot of times when people like this want to victimize themselves and they claim they've received death threats, what they really mean are people who write to them and say, oh, it'd be better off if you were to die or I'm hoping for your death. It's not actually a real death threat. 
I've actually received not just random emails, but threats so serious as a result of my journalism that governments have concluded that security measures are necessary for myself and for my family. I understand the difference between angry messages that come from random people online who are angry about your work and actual death threats. But if you're going to undertake work that's going to affect the public, sometimes you're going to be criticized and sometimes there's going to be deranged people who are going to criticize you. That's not unique to Kate Starbird or her colleagues who want to censor online. But you notice that every single time, this is something, of course, that media elites do all the time, they depict themselves as somehow being uniquely targeted with some kind of a threat in order to suggest that there are people out there who are dangerous and are threatening to them. There's almost nobody in public life on every side of the political spectrum who expresses political opinions of any kind for whom this isn't true. And yet they very selectively highlight which people are and which people aren't in order to try and induce not just sympathy for you, but to suggest that the people she's opposed to are the dangerous people who need policing. Now, again, they, in that example that 60 Minutes chose, they picked some tweet that was a very limited impact right before the 2020 election. A far more consequential lie told before the 2020 election that spread far and wide by the allies of 60 Minutes and Kate Starbird was that the reporting that was done by the New York Post based on documents found on Hunter Biden's laptop should be regarded, disregarded because it was, quote, Russian disinformation, a lie that came from 51 former members of the intelligence agencies. The reason that lie is not being highlighted by Kate Starbird or by 60 Minutes is because this is, at its heart, not a project that it's apolitical or devoted to finding truth. It is a deeply politicized project aimed at suppressing anti-establishment ideologies by labeling it disinformation, by pretending that they're engaged in some sort of neutral scientific endeavor to determine truth and falsity by people who don't care about politics, when in fact, these are the most political people on the planet. Nervous and uncomfortable, and it's hard to know the difference. This campaign against you is meant to discredit you, so we won't believe you. Absolutely. And it's interesting that the people that pushed voter fraud lies are some of the same people that are trying to discredit researchers that are trying to understand the problem. You're allowed to discredit researchers. You're allowed to question Kate Starbird. You're allowed to ask why it is that these people are any more entitled than anybody else to perform this role of dictating what is true and what is false, why they should have any special prerogative to advise big tech what should be removed and what shouldn't. And yet they act as though the very act of questioning their competence, their intentions, why they should wield this power is itself inherently immoral, that it's proof that you must be devoted to the spread of disinformation if you would dare question any of these people. That is what they do constantly. This is a newly resurrected framework. They're even doing that with that woman, Nina Yankovic, who was such a crazed resistance fanatic that if you looked at her tweets, she sounded like Taylor Lorenz on PCP, like the most like steroid intense version of the most fanatical resistance extremists. They wanted to put her in charge of Homeland Security's Ministry of Truth, the disinformation office. And when people objected and said that's not a function of government, they turned around and they started using what they called the attacks on Nina Yankovic as proof that disinformation experts are more needed than ever because the experts themselves are now being questioned. That's what this is all about. Did your research find that there was more misinformation spread by conservatives? Absolutely. I think uh, not just our research, research across the board looking at the 2020 election mm -hmm. found that there was more misinformation spread by people that were supporters of Donald Trump or conservatives. And the events of January 6th kind of underscore this. USA! The folks climbing up the Capitol building were supporters of, of Donald Trump, and they were they were misinformed by these false claims, and, and that motivated those actions. 
I'd be willing to bet that there is not a single disinformation expert, self-proclaimed disinformation expert, who has any sentiment for Donald Trump other than pure contempt and hatred. And that's because this is, at its core, a deeply political project. They are afraid that if the internet is free, they can no longer control how the public votes, how the public thinks, how the public reasons, how the public decides. They know that people have lost trust and faith in these kinds of people, in the Kate Starbirds and 60 Minutes of the World, and for good reason. Here is The Guardian at the beginning of this year trying to turn her into a victim. Quote, the stakes are really high, said The Guardian. The misinformation researcher changes task for 2024 U.S. election. Quote, Kate Starbird says attacks on her have made research difficult and claims of bias arise because of the prevalence of lies from the right. Do you see how they claim on the one hand that it's central to their project, that they're just apolitical, they have no political agenda, they're just trying to identify what is true and false, and yet in every instance, their attacks are on the populist right, the movement that supports Donald Trump. There is never a lie that they identify or combat that comes from the Washington establishment, even though that's where lies come from more than any other. The Guardian goes on, quote, Starbird, a misinformation researcher, herself became the subject of an ongoing misinformation campaign, but said she would not let that deter her from her research. Look how brave she is. She's getting criticized and she's gonna keep persisting in her work. Her team wasn't the only target of the conservative campaign against misinformation research, she noted. Researchers across the country have received subpoenas, letters, and criticism. Let me just tell you once again what these people are getting that makes them the victim of extreme attacks and intimidation campaigns. They're receiving subpoenas, letters, and even criticism kind of monsters do we have in the United States that target our lofty misinformation experts with criticism and subpoenas and requests for information, all attempting to frame misinformation research as partisan and as censorship because that's what it is. Quote, one practice that especially upset Jim Jordan and his colleagues was when researchers would flag misleading information to social media companies who would sometimes respond by amending fact checks or taking down false posts entirely. Nor is it just Congress attacking anti-misinformation work. A federal lawsuit from the attorneys general of Missouri and Louisiana alleges that the Biden administration violated the First Amendment by colluding with social media companies to censor and suppress speech. A new lawsuit from the state of Texas and two right-wing media companies takes aim at the Global Engagement Center a State Department agency that focuses on how power spreads, how, on how foreign power spread information. Now, I don't know if The Guardian didn't have space for this or if they just didn't think it was relevant, but they forgot to mention that the lower district court and the Court of Appeals, four different federal judges unanimously ruled that the program they referenced where the government was picking up the phone and coercing Facebook and Google and Twitter to remove disinformation identified by the Kate Starbirds of the world as false was actually unconstitutional. It was a grave attack on the First Amendment because it was in fact being directed by the government. Now, the fact that it's somehow a vicious, violent campaign to question Kate Starbird and her objectivity and to question whether or not she's really apolitical is laughable inherently. Of course these people should be questioned, given that they want to censor the internet. But the fact that Kate Starbird, of all people, is trying to hold herself out as apolitical, given her history, is an insult to your intelligence. Here she was on Facebook on October 31st, 2018, right before the midterm election in 2018. And this is what this apolitical, neutral, seeker of the truth, wrote to her followers on Facebook, quote, vote like you understand that a Dem majority in the House and Senate means that we can begin to hold this president and his friends and family accountable for things like corruption and collusion. So here was this disinformation expert accusing 
Donald Trump in 2018, the, as the Mueller investigation proceeded along of collusion, something for which Donald Trump, according to Robert Mueller, had not engaged in, or at least there was no evidence to establish that he had, that it will help stop his racist, anti-LGBT agenda from adding to the damage already done. Vote, she said. Like, you understand what the word nationalism coming out of the mouth of the President of the United States signals. That it doesn't mean patriotism, that, it un that its undertones are white supremacy and ethno-nationalism. Vote, she said, like you understand deep down that the lies this president tells over and over and that current Republican Congress people don't push back against are not frivolous or funny, but intentional and strategic. Vote, she said, like you understand the rise of fascism and white nationalism is happening all over the world. And that if we cannot stop it here, it won't be stopped. Vote because our country, our values, and even our freedom depend on it. Your children's lives depend on it. And if you cannot see these, then because I promise you that as an LGBT person, my rights depend upon it. Now, let me ask you a question. Having just read her stirring manifesto written before the 2018 election, do you think that Kate Starbird should be trusted as an apolitical, politically neutral expert to differentiate and dictate what truth and falsity is and that big tech companies should be bound by her pronouncements? One of the complaints that 60 Minutes made was that only 30% of the time, Twitter was responding to her request to remove information. And even that made no sense because X, now under Elon Musk, doesn't rely on a system of having specially credentialed and disinformation experts dictate what is false. They use a community-based system called Community Notes that relies on the people and by consensus to determine when a particular statement deserves context or correction because it's false. One of the people who has been investigating all of this, who has been looking into the way in which this system works and the organizations that are behind it is the independent journalist Lee Fong. He was formerly my colleague at The Intercept. He was one of the lead reporters on the Twitter files that looked into a lot of this. And he did a lot of work about not just Kate Starbird, but also the organizations with which she worked in trying to censor the internet. Lee, it's great to see you as always. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for coming on to talk to us. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I want to talk to you about uh, this uh, deeply apolitical, ideological, neutral expert, uh, Kate Starbird. And in particular, I want to begin with work that she has done with an organization called CISA, which is the Cyber uh, Security advisory committee and here we're going to put this on the screen this is a organization that is on the government's website and there you see the CISA cybersecurity advisory committee and one of its members is Dr. Kate Starbird who is listed as an associate professor of humorous human centered design and engineering at the University of Washington she has also uh, worked with what is called the Center for an informed public, part of the uh, election integrity project that they describe as a group that has joined with three other partners, the Stanford Internet Observatory, Graphica, and the Atlantic Council's uh, DFR lab to form a nonpartisan and mis- and disinformation research consortium to detect and mitigate the impacts of attempts to prevent or deter people from voting in the 2020 U.S. elections or to delegitimize election results. And there she is listed as part of that organization as well. So these are the vehicles that Kate Starbird uses to try and influence and even dictate to big tech companies what information they should and should not be permitted to be expressed and to be heard. What can you tell us about these organizations and how they function? I first became acquainted with St Kate Starbird and really started writing about CISA uh, in the fall of 2022. That's when I still worked at The Intercept. And in the process of writing a really lengthy story about CISA, the DHS, FBI, and its massive operation in terms of pressuring social media companies on content-related decisions and the history of that and the kind of 
the document showing their plans to expand that operation to include other topics beyond uh, the pandemic or the 2020 election to the U.S. involvement in the Russia-Ukraine war on racial justice, on, on many other topics. Um, in the process of writing the story that I, I published with Ken Klippenstein, I, I noticed this uh, CISA advisory panel on which Kate Starbird worked and that she was making uh, recommendations and kind of engaging in monthly meetings about this, the scope and focus of the DHS and, and FBI in, in this regard. And I filed a records request uh, to her research institute, something that I do on a fairly routine basis. That's how I do a lot of my work. It's based on uh, original source documents, you know, documents that I can obtain through uh, court order or from records requests. And uh, in a dynamic that you made very clear in, in the earlier part of your segment, um, she tweeted just the, the following day or two days later that she was under attack from a right-wing harassment campaign. And this is at a time that I worked at The Intercept, uh, which is far from a right-wing outlet, uh, but a right-wing uh, harassment camp campaign that included uh, overly broad uh, record requests that were tantamount to a denial of, uh, of service attack, a, a form of uh, a DDoS attack, a form of cyber attack that's basically akin to you know, overloading a target computer so it shuts down. Um, that's that's not what I did. I, I asked for a fairly targeted records request for her communications uh, with the major platforms in terms of how she was making content censorship recommendations and how she was communicating with the government to help shape government policies. You know, I was not asking for what she had for breakfast that morning or you know something to just to bog her down with trivial record requests. This is something that I do on powerful figures and, and, and important researchers around the country on, on a range of topics on a routine basis. So she positioned herself as kind of a victim here. And I, I find it a little bit ironic that she's constantly appearing in these uh, legacy media outlets. You know, this is kind of all coalescing around the Supreme Court looking at this issue. The New York Times had a big story depicting any kind of fight for uh, transparency or, or free speech on social media as a Trump instigated right wing uh, conspiracy or, you know, you, you looked at the 60 Minutes segments, very similar. And, and, you know, she was featured in the 60 Minutes segment and quoted by the New York Times. And, you know, I find it a little bit interesting because, you know, after I received the documents from that record request that, that you know, that I obtained after that story was published, it showed just so many more details. The fact that she was working closely um, with a portal funded uh, secretly by Pierre Omidyar, uh, the former funder of The Intercept, but a major Democratic donor um, for the work to help shape content decisions around the 2020 election. You know, sh sh this is a person who is allied with the, some of the largest foundations in the country, working hand in glove with both the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security in terms of uh, shaping content decisions, not just on Twitter, but on Facebook and other social media platforms. Um, so, you know, I, this whole kind of... Uh, effort to position herself as the victim uh, to say that, you know, there should that any kind of scrutiny of the folks who claim to be disinformation experts is harassment, um, I think is, is an effort just to dodge scrutiny of her work and to look kind of under hood, under the hood, because the public really has not known until very recently with a little bit more journalistic uh, inquiry and congressional oversight, how these content decisions have been made for years, that there's this whole kind of group of, of researchers and partisans and government operatives who have been making content decisions for a very long time. Yeah, but you know, in so many ways, like the whole project of being able to believe about yourself that you are somehow someone who has ascended to this position of kind of like floating expertise, somebody who can opine in an apolitical and a politically neutral way, whereas most other people can't, it almost inherently means about yourself that you do believe that you ought to be insulated from questioning or attack because you've reached this kind of superior position. And this has now become like a very common refrain in establishment journalism. You know, the Guardian article that we reviewed, there was this line that struck me where it said her team, meaning Kate Starbird's team, wasn't the only target of the conservative campaign against misinformation research, she noted. And then the uh, article went on to say, um, 
that researchers across the country have, quote, received subpoenas, letters, and criticisms. Like, it, you would expect in that sentence to find they have received nail bombs, death threats, and pistols pointed at their heads. But instead, what they're getting are subpoenas, letters, and criticisms. I'm sure, in at least partially in mind, she has some of the investigative work that you were trying to do to inform the public about who these people are. But what also strikes me about this, Lee, is The Guardian describes this as a conservative campaign against misinformation research. And this is for people who don't know. You and I first became acquainted with one another, at least first had our very first interaction. Thinking back in 2008 or 2009, at the time, I was a writer at Salon.com, which was very much considered a left liberal online political outlet. And at the time, you had written an article in The Nation, which is most definitely a left-wing magazine. And we were having a back and forth about certain views that I had expressed that were pretty much paid attention to solely by the left-wing segment of the political uh, spectrum. And certainly the whole idea that the internet should be free of government and state control it was a very pervasive view on the American left for a long time among American liberals. It certainly was never a right-wing idea. How did we arrive at the point where there's now this common theme that any questioning of these people is a harassment campaign and not just a harassment campaign in general, but a right-wing conservative harassment campaign in particular? Yes, you know, if you just use the kind of principles that Kate Starbird and these other disinformation researchers have professed, you were engaging in a harassment campaign of me by simply disagreeing with my views on Twitter. You know, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous. This is a um, a jujitsu move basically to parry any legitimate criticism and re reposition uh, these researchers as victims of a, of a gigantic conspiracy. Uh, you know, looking just broadly at, at the last few decades on the left, uh, free speech and in particular criticism of the Department of Homeland Security has been a non-controversial part of what liberals have believed. It's really just a, a recent phenomenon with the Trump election with concerns around you know, Russian interference on so social media, that the only reason that conservatives ever win elections is because of misinformation or, dis or disinformation. You know, these voters must be stupid or confused. Um, it it's kind of a diversion tactic rather than to confront the material reasons that people might be disaffected from the left or disaffected from Democrats. Um, th this is kind of the perfect scapegoat issue. And, and just in particular, the, the Department of Homeland Security, I mean, this is an agency formed after 9-11, a national security agency that for a very long time, Democrats on Capitol Hill were leading the efforts to uh, investigate and subpoena this agency to, to look at this agency's overreach into politics. Um, it was once very common among Democrats to say, hey, the Department of Homeland Security is kind of putting its thumb on the scales to help the Bush administration politically that, you know, was raising the terror alert uh, in the 2004 presidential election in a way that was designed to help uh, Republicans at, 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 uh, uh, in, in the elections that year, um, that maybe that this, this agency would be spying on Americans that would be engaging in, in surveillance that was very inappropriate, that would have a chilling effect on uh, Americans' uh, political speech. I mean, Democrats even worked uh, with Republicans. In fact, there was a bipartisan effort back in 2012, not, not ancient history, not that long ago, to convene a hearing on Capitol Hill to look at the Department of Homeland Security and demand answers. Why? Because the Department of Homeland Security had engaged just a social media monitoring firm to monitor speech on Twitter. Now, look what's happened in the last few years. They're working with these researchers, these, these other kind of security firms, to actually censor speech, to attach warning labels, or to actually remove uh, speech or to ban users because they've engaged in wrong thing. And again, you know, let's say, let's put aside the constitutional arguments. Maybe um, this is a, you know, constitutionally protected form of speech. I, you know, I don't think so. I, I think there's a legitimate debate there. But just put, putting that aside, if you look at the evidence that's been gathered around how the, the DHS and other agencies have intervened in speech-related decisions during elections, they've done so in a very partisan way. You see basically the same argument being made by conservatives that, you know, maybe don't trust uh, vote by mail, don't trust absentee 
ballots, um, you'll see conservatives being censored uh, in the 2020 election for making that argument. You, you look at the exact same tweets, essentially the same tweets from Democrats, Howard Dean and Eric Holder, ma you know, major Democratic voices saying, don't trust vote by mail because Trump controls the post office. Go vote in person. I mean, we, we have these tweets. We, we know that Twitter reviewed them. And those tweets were not censored. That's essentially the same argument of these conservatives saying don't trust vote by mail. Now, why were some tweets censored and others not, even though it was essentially the same argument? It looks like these censors were very partisan. It's exactly what you were saying earlier in the segment, that people like Kate Starbird present themselves as neutral experts, but they're essentially just partisan warriors. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.